Hi, good evening to everyone. I'm Dr. Philip McMillan, and I have been watching a video recently. I wasn't going to say anything this evening, but I captured a video that was on X with Dr. C. Malhotra. And if you don't know who he is, he is uh, quite well known as a cardiologist who spoke out against COVID vaccines. And it has put him in a lot of attention from many of the scientific pharmaceutical industry, and he continues to speak out. So he's a very, very important voice. The question is, is what triggered that change? Now, I usually, when I'm doing my interviews, I'm very interested in people's motivations for what they do and why they do it. And it would have been the same in his case. I've got the answer here in terms of what he said. So this is about a five minute clip and I'll share with you, I'll interrupt it temporarily just to add a few extra thoughts as to what he was saying. But let's get straight into what he was doing on this Dr. Tro's interview that's happened recently. And this is him, a clip from that presentation. We then get to the summer of 2021. One of the most difficult experiences and memories of my life still is, you know, my dad calls me. He has cardiac sounding chest pain. He's in Manchester. I'm in London. I tell him to call an ambulance. He calls his neighbors, ultimately has a cardiac arrest and dies. I then get involved in, co in covering an ambulance delay that was being, uh, you know, the, 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 the government and the Department of Health had, had kept from the public for, for months that was happening all across the country. And, you know, publish on that and make mainstream gun BBC News talking all about that stuff. Pausing you here, this is an important point. What you can see very clearly is that he's not afraid of challenging narratives because what he was focused on was that there was an ambulance delay and that may have contributed to his father's death. You don't know for certain. But if there was a delay and he had a cardiac arrest, then the presumption would be that if you had reached earlier, there may have been a chance. But it indicates that he takes very strong stances and is not afraid to rock the boat. And this is why he became so important in the context of what happened afterwards with regards to challenges about COVID vaccines. But let's continue to listen. But my dad's post-mortem findings come back. And initially people are saying, oh, don't, you know, he's just had a heart attack. What's the point? I said, like, no, this doesn't make sense. I, we, you know, I did a calcium score on my dad a few years earlier, right? And it was like 200 and something. So he had like moderate, right? But he. I'm pausing you there again, just so that I, I clarify the point here. So what he was saying was that he knew his father had heart disease, but he had done a calcium score. And this is a specific CT um, imaging of the heart, looking at the deposition of calcium in the arteries. And a score of about 200 indicates that he had moderate calcification in the arteries, not severe. And that's why, that's part of the reason why he was concerned about why this occurred. And you'll hear some more as to what it was, but let's continue to listen to him here. Then lost weight, he'd quit sugar, he was in a better position, his blood pressure pills had been reduced. So if anything, knowing how coronary disease develops and progresses from a metabolic health point of view, it should have stabilized at the very least. He had critical stenosis. I was like, this doesn't make sense. Was he really stressed out? You know, I, I, I couldn't I couldn't understand why. And then November 2021, for me, that was the light bulb moment. Stephen Gundry publishes an abstract in circulation, which reveals that within eight weeks of the mRNA vaccine. And by the way, I'll tell you an interesting story about Stephen, because I met him recently to find out what happened with him. And he hasn't. I'm sure he wouldn't mind me telling you this, but his story is fascinating with how he got to this, understood this. Right. So he published his paper looking at, um, you know, uh, I think hundreds of his patients, middle age, and within eight weeks of having two doses of mRNA, Pfizer and Moderna, the baseline risk, looking at inflammatory markers correlated with heart disease, went from 11% risk of heart attack in five years to 25%. Pause you there. Uh, this is an important point with regards to what was happening there. So 11 to 25%. I do remember um, something about that paper coming up. And it was one of those moments where you thought, this is so serious that 
there's got to be a change in the way how it was being rolled out. Now, for anyone who has listened to me, is that I have always been concerned about the broad rollout. I've always accepted that early in the pandemic, people didn't understand many of the um, path, much of the pathophysiology. And so they wouldn't have been concerned about spike protein autoimmune responses. And therefore, in my view, they should have targeted the high risk, which is what they had planned to do. Where the problems came was when they rolled it out to the low risk cohorts as well. And that, in my view, and no one can convince me otherwise, that that wasn't a, a high risk strategy, which I don't think has borne out. But what he was flagging here, uh, Dr. Malhotra, was that increase in risk within eight weeks, suggesting this was an inflammatory process. And truthfully, that would perfectly align with spike protein immune responses, triggering the immune system. Many people don't realize, realize that a lot of the deposition of plaque in arteries is by macrophages. If you overactivate the macrophages, you will have more inflammation in the lining and therefore more deposition. And so it can accelerate the process, whichever thing causes this inflammatory um, change. Let's continue to listen. And I was like, Part of my language, I was like, penny drops for me. Okay, one bit of data, but this now for me, being someone that publishes on heart disease being a chronic inflammatory condition, this would explain probably what happened to my dad. And if this is real, we will see a signal in the real world. And then I get a Times journalist call, who called me a few weeks earlier saying, we've got an unexplained increase in heart attacks since July, 25% increase in hospitals in Scotland. I then get a whistleblower from the University of Oxford that calls me up saying a group of researchers that have accidentally found through imaging that in vaccinated, there is a signal of coronary inflammation, which is not there in the unvaccinated. So for me, there was more than enough data to say. So, these so yeah, so this is, he is right. These flags and these signals were coming out at that time, late 2021. And maybe it was at a time where there was a bit more of perspective that if there are issues, we need to look out for them and address them. I have no idea how these signals were then pushed away. It's one thing to ignore the signal, but what you would expect is a corroboration or saying, okay, we don't know if this is right. Let's reanalyze this. Let's look again. Nothing. If he hadn't mentioned those papers, you probably would not have even realized that those signals were present at the time. Let's, let's continue. Speak out and say, hold on a minute. Can, we, can somebody look at this? There, there might be a problem here. That's when everything turned. But as with all my other advocacy, everything I've done where I've gone really hard on the mainstream stuff and got stuff into the media has always happened from a medical journal publication because I've only felt confident enough to do it and, and to, and to um, be able to really dig deep and look at the pros and cons of everything I think or, or I'm suspicious of, whether it's about sugar or low-carb diets, to do it through a medical journal first. So I thought, let me spend some time looking at all of the information on the vaccine and, and reach out to people who had greater expertise than me in immunology, for example, and figure it out. And then I published in the Journal of Metabolic Health, then formerly Insulin Resistance, peer reviewed, still stands up to scrutiny, 2022, and 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 basically said we need to suspend the vaccine, basically because the you know from from there's more than enough data to suggest that the harms outweigh the benefits, even from the beginning, probably for everybody. Pause there. That was a huge statement, and. Um... I suspect when I think about it now, and when I look back at what happened, is that he almost pushed them too far. How do you say it? Sometimes you have to be pragmatic. And if you, if you push too hard, sometimes you get nothing. And I think a better call at that time would have been to focus the attention on the high risk, which is eventually what everybody has done, except probably the USA, focus on the high risk and investigate the patterns that are occurring at the same time. So for people who were concerned or afraid, you could still vaccinate them if they wanted to. You definitely don't do man mandates. And it gives you a chance to look and focus on where the risks really are. Sadly, a lot of that didn't happen and it just literally disappeared. The questions disappeared. And I can only warn the scientific and medical community, this is going to come back to haunt us. 
because spike protein autoimmune responses don't disappear. They still continue. And let me just mention this before I continue. I want you all to make sure autoimmunity 101, how can immune privilege change you? This is really important because it's demonstrating that for quite a number of conditions, we're seeing a change in the pattern of disease because of this issue about autoimmunity. So yes, I want you to join, look in the description below, make sure you join us in that conversation. But let's continue. Right, which is a big statement to make. And I lined up everything to hit the mainstream news as I've done before, because part of what I do as a, as a public health advocate is understand the media and understand that if I'm going to say something, I'm going to throw the kitchen sink and making sure it, you know, I have a hierarchy like world news, front page of British newspapers, if not, uh, not the lead story in the, new, in, the, in the page three or whatever. And I had, I won't name this person because he's a good guy, worked with him before. He was ready for the exclusive for two months. And on the last day, when the when and I told the editor of the journal, hold off publication, we would line it up for this guy to get it in the mainstream news. Because at that point, I realized if it's mainstream news in the UK and a mainstream British newspaper, it's game over. The vaccine will be suspended to me. I knew how know how these things work. And he pulled back last minute and he came up with some strange excuse saying the British Immunological Society response to your article is this, the British Heart Foundation response to your article, which is in the past he's always published their responses because you've got to have balance, you've got to have well. They're going to criticize, you know, I've had this on low carb mm -hmm. diets. Like, doctor, you know, we've got stuff in the Guardian. It was like British Heart Foundation say that his views on low carb diets and cholesterol is dangerous or some sort of bull like that. Right. So mm -hmm. I was expecting all that and I was ready for it. Yeah. But he didn't even go and publish the article. And Pause here again. This is this is important. And it, it shows you how powerful, <laughs> how powerful or how difficult it is to go against that kind of mainstream narrative. So in effect, he, this, this guy he was talking about knew that the story was big, knew the story should be published, but couldn't do it for whatever reason. And it shows you the implications of doing things like these. And so I think in years to come, a lot of credit will be given to Dr. Malhotra, certainly when it came to arguing from my point of view, I think they tried to position him as an anti-vax, even though he had been promoting the vaccine and was vaccinated himself and his family was vaccinated. It's just that he did a reanalysis of what occurred and came to a different conclusion. I'm not sure people or scientists are allowed to do that these days. They have to stay within the narrative because getting outside of it is just too risky. Let's continue. And I was like, okay, let me, I was, I was actually gutted at the point. I was like, cause I spent all this time and I said, this is so bad. We, you know, and I was so dedicated to making sure no people, no one else is going to be harmed from this vaccine, COVID vaccine. So then I thought outside the box and I remember a story of, um, you know, an editor of a newspaper in South Africa during the apartheid regime who basically, you know, the rest of the world didn't know what was actually going on. How, um, Steve Biko, this young doctor who was pre Mandela, was this, uh, you know, freedom activist for, you know, uh, for civil rights. And he got brutally murdered in prison and it was all being covered up. And this editor of a newspaper couldn't, you know, he was now being followed. He basically, there's a great movie, by the way, you should watch, it's called Cry Freedom. And he basically escaped South Africa and he said, I can get this into the news in England. He got it to the news in England, explained what had been going on. And then there was huge international pressure in South Africa. So thinking with that mindset, I was like, okay, we're a global community here. I have... I'm known in other countries, Australia, India, I've had mainstream media coverage there. I got it into the Times of India. And then the ball started rolling. Next, I'm in the States a couple of months later, and I'm going on Tucker Carlson, you know, uh, and I'm being interviewed on Fox News. And I was like, okay, let's just keep this ball rolling. Let's keep the campaign. So, yes, yeah, so powerful statements in terms of what triggered his perspective, what changed it in terms of his father's death. And sadly, it sometimes takes moments like that for people to really think and to reflect and to consider the implications. As, as I've always said, when it comes to this pandemic, I can literally predict what history is going to say 50 years down the line. And fundamentally, this was a pandemic 
that started off well. There was lots of collaboration, great movement in the scientific community to find solutions. When the first big solutions were found, they were sidelined, in my view, including steroids. And it has demonstrated that maybe the priority wasn't just about saving lives. And when we see what happened later on, we see that effectively we were put in a position where it was vaccines or nothing. I don't see how history is going to look at that in any way that's good. And just a warning to those who are on that narrative, fundamentally, you are going to see that there are huge issues in the future. And what we have to do is try and find out and figure out what is going on, try and understand the mechanism, understand the patterns. So this is what I am doing. And this is where this presentation is coming from, Autoimmunity 101. And what you may not realize, and I'll be touching on it mainly for the first time in this presentation, is that I have now got almost 10 years of hospital admission data, analyzing it, trying to look at unusual patterns of conditions that are increasing and decreasing, and looking at it through the autoimmune perspective. It's a very important journey. If you are interested, please come along. And don't forget, Humming Heroes, one of the best ways, simplest things you can do to protect yourself, hum, increase your nitric oxide. There's a lovely little book that you can give to someone as a Christmas gift. And we will continue this journey of science. Have a great evening. A hero, an immune adventure, humming heroes, your lyrical guide to the body's defenders. Now on Amazon, check the links below.